do want to just say thank you to everyone who's serving this morning. It's actually it's a pretty good sized crew of people. Uh, maybe a dozen people that have to show up and maybe show up at a practice before they show up for Sunday morning or show up to set up or show up to clean up. Uh, it's uh, There's a bit of work that goes into uh, our worship service every Sunday. And some of that work is not as visible as other work. So I just want to say thank you to everyone. If I start trying to name names, uh, that won't work out. But uh, thank you. You've probably heard the expression, uh, get over yourself. <laughs> Jeff, you've never heard that, no. Yeah, get over yourself. Now you've heard it. Are you getting over yourself? How's it working out? It's common for us to think, believe, advise that, and we say this in a more positive fashion, when we say you should be part of something bigger than yourself. Or we say it's good if you're part of something bigger than yourself. We live in a society. We don't just live by ourselves. Uh, there's an old, old saying, no man is an island. Probably comes from Hamlet. Everything comes from Hamlet in English. No man is an island. Yet in our culture these days, it seems to me that we're often encouraging people to be islands and to do the very opposite of getting over themselves but to elevate themselves, to consider themselves first. Back in the uh, 1980s, we, we used this expression, uh, first things first. And what we meant was looking out for number one. Looking out for number one. Well, what's number one? You, me. Oh, wait. But if you're looking out for number one and I'm looking out for number one, who's number one? We don't all have the same number one, it seems. In fact, we each have our own, and it's me. So there's a strain in human society, this note that gets played all the time, these two contradictory notes, one that says, get over yourself, and the other one says, never get over yourself, but consider yourself, and always consider yourself first. Oh, and don't pay any attention to anyone who criticizes you. I just have to tell you this, it is really, really extremely unwise to adopt the rule, don't pay attention to anyone who criticizes you. It is a formula for remaining ridiculous. We are in operate in this sort of contradictory state where we say, oh, get over yourself, but don't get over yourself. Here's the thing. Do you really need, do we all need to be part of something bigger than ourselves? I believe we do. I believe we were created 
part of something bigger than ourselves. Both in our fellowship with the living God who made us, because we were the only creatures made to operate in active fellowship with the one who made us. Dolphins are really smart, but they don't pray. We are the praying ones. We are the ones created to operate in the likeness bearing the image of God, to walk in fellowship with God, to be part of something bigger than ourselves and to be part of the family of humanity that is bigger than ourselves. Now, we broke this, and that's where we get the nonsense, the alienating nonsense of the world. When we turned away from God, maybe accidentally, but it certainly was the result that we turned away from each other. So when Adam and Eve turned away from God, immediately they stopped trusting each other. Their intimate fellowship also broke. And we find out in the next chapter, their fellowship with the planet broke. Now, it will take toil and sweat and pain to simply get enough to eat out of the earth. Fellowship broke. But here's the good news. In Christ, fellowship is restored. Fellowship is made possible again. And in the church, the body of Christ, we are the ones being caught up into the eternal fellowship of the triune God again. Like the song says, we're joining the everlasting song. The chorus of the glory of God among the persons of God. The greatness of God reflected, noticed, realized, and praised, appreciated. We are in Christ restored to that. That is something much bigger than any one of us. And that is what we are called to be a part of in Christ. But in our modern way of thinking, we often say things like, you don't have to be a part of the church to be in Christ. And there's a certain technical sense in which that might be kind of true. You can be a born-again person and not much have much of a relationship with the other born-again people. That could happen. But what the Scripture teaches us is that you were joined to the church before you were joined to God in Christ. And that there is no such thing as an isolated Christian who is not, whether they are active in it or not, a part of the body of believers. It never has ever happened even once. When you are joined to Christ, you are joined to the rest of us who are joined to Christ. There's no other way. And what the book of Ephesians teaches us is that to really enjoy the fact that we're joined to Christ, we really enjoy that fact in our experience of being joined to one another where we reflect this magnificent love toward each other, where we serve as he served. I love the illustration of the washing of feet in that song. 
Jesus says to Peter, if I don't serve you, you're not with me. So, of course, the beginning point is Jesus serves us. And then he says, this is how you ought to be. Servants. Whoever wants to be first in the kingdom of God should be the servant of all. So we are here being caught up in the eternal fellowship of the triune God, joining the everlasting song, living out our reconciliation to one another and to God in Christ. This is a great, glorious, magnificent thing that forgiveness can be dispensed from one person to another in the love of God in the body of Christ. That a person can simply show up and let their smiling face be seen and the rest of us be encouraged, uplifted, built up in love because of that simple, simple act of service. A person's simple presence in the assembly of the body of Christ is a work of service for the building up of the body of Christ in love. Everyone in the whole wide world knows that what the world needs now is love, sweet love. We are the people in the body of Christ who are actually connected for real to the only source of real love. That other people can exhibit it is simply a sort of remnant leftover shadow of their creation in the image of God. We're the ones who actually know it and should be exhibiting it, becoming a part of something much bigger than ourselves. And what we're reading and studying in Ephesians chapter 4 is simply how that operates in the real life, the everyday life of the body, of the church, even of the local church, one little cell group of this great body. So this morning we want to look at how do we get over ourselves. We often talk about are you growing as a Christian But you know, the growing that's happening in Ephesians chapter 4 is not me growing and you growing and each of us growing as a Christian. It certainly includes that. But the main thing, the main event is how is the church growing to be the fullness of God in Christ, to be the real exhibit of Christ in the world and among ourselves? How do we grow? So we're reading this in Ephesians chapter 4, where this is the text. I'm going to read it to you. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. So that's some people he gave to the church to equip all the people in the church, that's the saints, for them to do the work of service. To the building up of the body of Christ, there's the growth until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Are we done yet? No, because I don't think we have attained to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ yet. I certainly see shortcomings in my own self and how I relate to you. So, still more growing to be done. As a result, he says in verse 14, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming, but 
speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. So he's repeating himself, isn't he? We're growing to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And here we're growing up in all aspects into him, the one new man, into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. If you ask, what is the point of the church? The point of the church is the building up of the church. In the modern age, we generally speak about the point of the church being helping all the individual Christians to be as good as they can possibly be as individual Christians. But the point of the church in the book of Ephesians is that the church as a whole, in which each one of us has a little part, forms the Christian in the world. For the building up of itself in love. So I wanted to just look at what this text says about how the church grows. And I have two categories of how the church grows. One is called the ways. What are the ways we grow? And the other is called the means. That is, wh how, what does anyone do to cause that growth? And so I've kind of categorized the expressions in this text. Some of these we talked about last time. <coughs> so, for example, we looked at verse 13. We saw that we grow until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge. There's faith and knowledge. <coughs> so we grow in trusting Christ and knowing Christ. Faith, knowledge of the Son of God. Trusting Christ, knowing Christ. And knowing Christ is knowing a person. <coughs> this might involve uh, learning the doctrines of Scripture. I, it does, in fact, involve that. But what we're talking about is knowing a person, not just knowing the doctrines. And it is possible, I suppose, for a person to study a lot and understand Greek and Hebrew and have an uh, encyclopedic knowledge of theology and not know Christ that well or even at all. And what we're talking about is knowing someone, not knowing about things. And we're talking about trusting someone, not believing a set of doctrines. Though Believing the set of doctrines is a very important factor in how we trust the person. I mean, you can't go without it, but it's not all there is to it. We trust Christ, Jesus, the man, God eternal, made flesh, gave his life, sacrifice for my sin and yours reconciled us together in the body of Christ and together reconciled us one new man in Christ before God Almighty. Sent his spirit to dwell in us and in each of us. We trust him. We know him. And of course, we're growing into unity in these things. This chapter begins with that exhortation to live in a manner that is worthy of the calling with which you've been called, which is to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The bond of peace is Christ. As we read in chapter 2, He Himself is our peace. He is the reconciler. He is the one that makes us one in Him. And we should be ready at all times to live in the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What matters most in my relationship to you is we are together in Christ. We are one in Him. 
We are the ones who trust and know him. We are the ones who are together in him. Now, this does lead to some sort of individual maturity and security. He says, as a result, we are no longer to be children. That's a plural word, children. In other words, we're each to grow up. We're each to be mature, to experience maturity. And in my way of understanding this text, that maturity is to operate in active union with the rest of us. To serve, not to be served. To do the work, to be ready. So we're no longer children tossed here and there by waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine. This picture is like a baby floating in the ocean. I've been watching Brian uh, Stork, who's part of our church, but right now he's uh, doing the transatlantic crossing. Well, he's done it mostly now, but the transatlantic crossing in a sailboat with uh, what six other or five other people or something like that and they're going they went from the bahamas to bermuda and then now they've crossed over to the azores uh and they crossed the middle all the way across the ocean in what really is a tiny vessel and they're out there in the middle. Of it. He's had showed this one video on Facebook where they were swimming. And he mentioned that they're swimming in 13,000 feet of water in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. 13,000 feet, that's 4,000 meters. What if you didn't have a boat? And what if you were a little child in the middle, in the waves and the wind? That's the mental picture of this text. You're no longer in the category of a little child in the wind and the waves as a result of the equipping of the saints for the work of service, for the building up of the body, until we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Until we all come to a mature man. Now what this tells me is the key to my maturity and my security is the fellowship that we have in Christ and with God in Christ. That it's not just what you know. It's who you're with. Now, it would be right crazy for me to get on a sailboat and try to sail across the Atlantic Ocean. What if I tried to do it and tried to do it by myself? Well, that would be the last thing you ever heard from me. You got to have a good boat and you got to have a good crew. You don't want to do that by yourself. Now, people have done it by themselves, but you know, even when they do it by themselves, they don't do it by themselves. They've got people looking out for them. They've got stars to look at. They didn't make the stars. They didn't invent the compass or the GPS. What makes me safe in the ocean of this world is that I know you. And that we together know him, the creator of this world the Redeemer of us. It's not just about what you know, it's about who 
you know. And so we find in the body of Christ our personal maturity and security. And then it says we're, we grow by being fitted and held together. <laughs> you can't do that by yourself. You can't be held together alone. It takes at least two. It's the whole group and the whole body fitted and held together by what each one of us supplies. That's how we grow. We become more fitted and more held together. And in becoming more fitted and more held together, we also become more secure and more mature, each one. And we also experience the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And we also learn to know Christ because you've seen Christ in ways I haven't. We bring each one something, each one a gift from God to the rest of us. And so we come to know Him and trust Him. And so we grow together and the body together is built up in love that's how the church grows we grow in trusting christ knowing christ unity in those things in our individual maturity and stability in christ we jo we become more and more held together that's about our the strength and and magnitude of our fellowship with one another and we are built up in love I just want you to notice, like I always do, growth is defined here. The growth of the Christian is defined here in terms of fellowship. Using words like knowing, as in knowing a person, trusting, as in trusting a person, and coming to love someone. These are all terms of relation, terms of fellowship. And the growth of the Christian is the growth of the body of Christians, the community of Christians. It has not ever been God's intention for individuals to be isolated, to become islands. That is the destruction of Satan that we are alienated from him and so from one another. And the purpose of the cross of Christ is to reverse that alienation and to restore us to fellowship with him and consequently fellowship with each other. Or perhaps restore us to fellowship with each other in such a way that we together are restored to our fellowship with him. That's really what Ephesians 2 says that's how we grow we grow in fellowship with God in Christ this could happen by more people coming into the body of Christ that would be a way the body grows people join the fellowship by faith in Christ people hear the good news of God's reconciling work in the cross of Christ and they put their faith in Christ and they become one of us the body grows or people grow in fellowship with God. Like you could understand and appreciate more than you did before you got here this morning, more about your own reconciled relationship to God in Christ. You could become stronger in that. Or you could become stronger in your love for the other Christians because you've become stronger in your understanding of the love of God for you you become more reflective of that love and you become a, the sort of person that he was is you become the sort of person that is willing to make a sacrifice for someone else's benefit and our bond grows stronger so I ask you this question how much do these relationships mean to you 
our relationship to one another in the body of Christ and our relationship in the body of Christ to God in Christ by the Spirit. What if you were deprived of these relationships? How much do they matter? Many of us in the body of Christ, I think, take these relationships way too casually, and that is a tragedy. That is a tragedy. So I pray that the Spirit of God would generate the love of God in us. How much do these relationships matter in your life? Well, here's what I would tell you. The, the honest answer to that question is more than you think. These relationships matter in your life more than you realize. Now, I'm just describing how the church grows. The church grows in fellowship, in fellowship with God by knowing and trusting in Christ, by the ministry of the Spirit in us, and in our fellowship with one another. The church grows. And by the addition of more people into that whole thing. But how? What are the means by which we grow? What do we do to grow in these ways? There's things we do in this text. Now, the Jesus himself was very clear. He said, I will build my church. So we have to be careful not to take too much on ourselves. And I realize I'm sort of guilt tripping you this morning in a way that I don't usually do and I don't really like to do because his commandments are not burdensome. What I hope is you see this not as a, a burden of guilt, but as a present, real, positive opportunity for you. And for you in making us what we could possibly be. But what? What do we do? What are the means? Well, the first thing I see in this text is we're equipped. We're equipped. So I would say, what can you do? Be equipped. I guess you could think of it like this. What do you think you might like to do in the work of service in the body of Christ that you don't feel ready to do? And you think, okay, well, that would be, it'd be nice to do that, but I'd be clueless if I tried to. Or I don't have the resources, blah, blah, uh, whatever. Whatever equipping you might, if you think about well, what would be a nice thing to do and you don't feel ready to do it, then w you need to be equipped. And people like me, pastors and teachers, are here to equip you. So there's the thing I could do. We're going to have later this year, we're going to have a, something we're calling the Institute of Leading Servanthood, where we're going to have kind of an equipping class about how to be a servant in the body of Christ that would encourage other people to be servants in the body of Christ. A second thing you could do is serve. Do the work of service. The thing you're equipped for. Some things you might be able to do, and this is kind of what we talked about last Sunday when I said, you know, what is a work of service? A work of service is anything you do aimed at building up the body of Christ. It doesn't have to be a big old thing. It doesn't have to be even visible. If you prayed this morning before you got here that this would be a uh, positive, useful, whatever, 
a fruitful meeting of the, of the body of Christ, if you prayed and nobody knows but you that you prayed, that was a work of service. If you showed up here and you were reasonably friendly to the other people, that's a work of service, especially if you didn't really feel like it. If you got up this morning, you said, uh, I don't know if I want to go to church, and you came anyway, that was a work of service. Oh, and even if you didn't feel that way and you just showed up, that's a work of service. This could be the most trivial thing you could even think of that I think there's a lot of works of service that we do that we don't even count as works of service. We just do them because of who we are. And it's how we would behave no matter where we were. And yet it ends up serving the fellowship of the body when you are simply present here. Of course, there are works of service that are very visible. Here I am preaching. I hope it's a work of service for the building up of the body of Christ. And everyone knows I'm doing it. It's very visible. We have musicians who play. We have people who work in the tech team. We have people who are teaching the kids. We have people who are working in our youth ministry. We have people doing all kinds of things. And there are opportunities for things that we're not doing that we could do if only the person who would do them was available and we knew about it. Do the work. As we do the work of service, God builds up the body. We, are, we become one. We strengthen our fellowship. We strengthen our fellowship with him and with each other. The third thing here is speaking the truth in love. Now that's a challenge to speak the truth in love. You know, the Bible describes Jesus as full of grace and truth. I think, wow, that's quite a trick. I usually choose between grace and truth. Like, okay, I got to be honest with you. Before I deliver some kind of brutal honesty. Maybe not so loving. Although telling somebody the truth, even a bad truth, is a loving thing to do. But you ought to do it lovingly. And sometimes I think love... Leaves the truth alone. Because I don't want to be mean. Well, what we're called to in the body of Christ is to be honest in love. To be truthful in love. And of course, the main truth we speak is the truth of the goodness of God and Jesus. That's the main truth. That's the overwhelming truth. That's the truth. Every other truth grows out of. And so speaking the truth in love is to tell someone the goodness of God in the sacrifice of Christ and in the power of the Spirit. That's the truth we speak in love. And so when we gather on Sunday for worship, the main thing we do is review God's grace. That's Romans 12, 1. In view of God's mercy, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, in full view of God's mercy. What is my job as the preacher? It is to stand in front of you, in front of the grand canyon of the grace of God in Christ and say, do you see this? The magnificence of it? The magnitude of it? Are you enjoying just how good God has been to you by sending His Son? 
No, you're not. You need to see it better. You need a clearer view. That's why we have preachers. I'll hopefully I help you with this. I say here, look at the magnificence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Speak the truth in love. <coughs> then the last thing on our list here is a proper working of all the parts in relation to the other parts. <laughs> the proper working of a part is never apart from the body. Let's think about this for a second. Let's use the illustration of a motorcycle. Motorcycles have engines. Engines have spark plugs. So suppose you're a spark plug in the engine of the motorcycle, which is the body of Christ. You're the spark plug, and you are out there in the world trying to spark. Well, here's something a spark plug can't do. Spark if it's not connected to the engine. It's impossible. You could be out there going, oh, if only I could spark. But if you don't have the wire hooked to your head, you're not sparking. Oh, and if you're not plugged into the cylinder, your sparking is of no use whatsoever. Because you could get a spark plug and you could make it spark and get nothing but the spark. It's made to be part of the whole. And so the body of Christ is each of us made to be a part of a whole. And when we try to function, even in our gifted nature, we try to function apart from the body, it doesn't work. And it certainly does not produce the effect of the body where every part joined to the other parts does its part. And so we need to be <laughs> properly working in relation to the other members of the body. We need to function together. That means I need you. This church needs you. This is why in the book of Hebrews it describes, not, it uses this expression, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. That word forsaking literally means to leave stranded or shorthanded. Each of us has a role to play, a connection, a point, of, a part, a place in the body and this is how we grow we let ourselves be equipped we do the work of service and I would just say to you do whatever work of service you find to do and if you don't know what to do ask me I'll see if I can come up with something we have areas of need in this ver in this church find a part serve do the work speak the truth share the gospel let us remind one another how fantastic is it that we know God in Christ and find your place and do your thing in relation to the rest of us doing our things because the whole thing is much bigger than any one of us it is actually essential to human flourishing <laughs> that people are part of something bigger than themselves even people who don't know the glory of God's grace in Christ know that but we are the ones who are connected to the very source of it and have the opportunity to participate in the building up of the body. 
my closing question for you this morning is just a, something for you to think about, and that is, what is your place? Are you a spark plug? Are you a cylinder head? Are you a throttle lever? I don't know. I'm, I'm stuck on the motorcycle. What is your place? Do you know what it is? Uh, do you see yourself where you fit? Do you feel like you fit? These are all things for us to think about and work on. So I have some ways for you to think about this. And by the way, we are going to talk about this in detail next Sunday. How does a person understand where they fit in the church, in the body of Christ? So here's some questions, though, that you could be thinking about in the meantime. What do you think the church should be doing that you don't currently see happening? You understand the question? What do you think the church should be doing? And by the church, I mean this church, the one you're part of. And if you're not a regular part of this church, the one you are a regular part of. And if you're not a regular part of one, you understand what I've said this morning, right? You ought to be. And so whatever you see and you think, wow, the church should be doing something about that, that might be a clue as to your place. It might mean it's your place to mention that to the rest of us see what happens or it might mean you see it because you are the one God has in mind for doing something about it could be any of that stuff here's another question thinking about what's your place what do you like to do <laughs> what do you like to do what if your answer to that question is I like to kite board, surf, swim, run. Wow, why am I thinking of all this physical stuff? I like to eat. I like to hang out with people that I like. Uh, what else do I like to do? I like to do a lot of things. What do you like to do? And why did God bring someone who likes those things into this fellowship? He did not do it by accident. So the question is, what do you like to do? And there's a part B to the question. How could you like doing that in a way that improves the quality or the reach of our fellowship. Because here's something that I do. I like to scuba dive. You know what I do? I go scuba diving with some people that I like every week and it improves the quality and the extent of our fellowship. Now when I started doing it, I wasn't thinking of that at all. It just kind of accidentally had that effect. Hmm. What do you like to do and how could it be employed to uh, improve the extent or the quality of the fellowship of the body of Christ? You see, fellowship is a multifaceted thing. What if the thing you like to do is eat? You know, for a long time I had this meeting and then everyone got kind of tired of having this meeting. It wasn't a meeting really. It was a Friday lunch club. Guess what I like to do every Friday? have lunch. And all we did was I would send out a text to everybody who signed up to get this text. I'm going to have lunch at this place. And anyone who wants to can show up and have lunch together at that place. And this, I believe, for some period of time served to improve the extent and the quality of our fellowship in the body of Christ. You see, it doesn't have to be some ministry In fact, I sometimes think the most important ways we extend the quality and the reach of our fellowship 
is doing things we would never call ministry. So what do you like? What do you like? Last question. What would you want to do if someone would help you learn how to do it? This, your answer to this question, I am very interested in knowing. What would you want to do if someone would only help you figure out how? You see, almost anything you might do can be done as a work of service in the body of Christ. That's the vision I hope we develop as we study through this. Next Sunday, we're going to talk more about what, it, what exactly is a part in the body of Christ because it's not literally like a spark plug. It's not that mechanical. But what is a part? What are the aspects of a person's part in the body? And how does a person get those things? And where? Uh, yeah, we're going to talk all about that next Sunday. Meanwhile, think about it. What's your place? What do you think we ought to be doing that isn't happening yet? What do you like to do that could contribute to this? And what would you want to do if only someone would show you how? Think about it. Between now and next Sunday, pray about it. Because here's what I want to see in this church. I want to see Ephesians 4 visibly operating where people are equipped people are serving each one is doing their part and they're doing it in connection with the other parts so that we see the building up of the body of Christ in love wouldn't that be a fantastic thing now I'm saying that like it's not already the case and it is already the case but wouldn't it be great if we can grow in exactly that way I think it would. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the love of Christ. Thank you for the love of the body of Christ. Thank you for these people who are here this morning. Lord, we pray for the impact of your word in our lives, in our hearts. Help us to know Christ, to trust Christ, to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Lord, we ask that you would build us up in love, that you would build your church and that we would see that work in this fellowship. The operation of your magnificent grace in our lives, in fellowship with you, with one another, and with the world around us. We pray for these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.